Um, again, welcome to event running. We are going to start with Autocrat. Uh, so, Autocrat, let's, let's get into it. Um, first and foremost is the oh-so-important bid writing process. So, when you are writing the bid, you must state the, the crap positions that you will be filling at the event and who will be filling those roles. So, you're going to want to have uh, the autocrat, which would be you in this case. Um, the fundcrat, if you have any sort of fundraising or auctions, um, that is an optional thing, though highly advised. Uh, the sitecrat, the ANS or colorcrat, uh, your questocrat, again, if there are quests, uh, your war and reavacrat, your feastocrat, your trollocrat, your metacrat, your security crat, and if there are any positions that are not filled, uh, you would put TBA or TBD. Uh, again, that's sort of your last ditch effort. Um, you should have these filled, um, but there's going to be extenuating circumstances where maybe um, real life scenarios gotta make sure like oh i'm super like i'm like 98 percent sure i'll totally be able to do this position for you but i gotta check with my boss and he won't know till thursday but you gotta send in the bid on wednesday right you can even state in there that you're pretty certain that it will be this person but just in case tbd or uh tba so that's gonna be what you're putting in there uh, next will be the schedule. You want to write down the schedule for the event that you have planned. So in this schedule, uh, some things will or will not apply, but these are options for you. Um, you're going to want to have troll, right? You're going to want to say when it opens and if it closes at any point. Um, if you have any melee or ANS tournaments, you are going to want to have, uh, if there's a pre-registration, you're going to want to have that. If there's submissions or start times, um, sorry, submission start and end times. And then you want to have the actual start times of the tournaments. Uh, also, if there's any sort of end time for them, you want to state that as well. Uh, if you have battle games or ANS or color activities, you're also going to want to state those. Uh, quest, if you have quest, you're going to want to have, um, if there's any sort of pre-registration or sign-up times, like if you're doing blocks with smaller groups, you're going to want to have that. You're going to want to have um, your NPC meeting, um, which could be on a separate thing closer to the, to the event, um, so not necessarily on the bid, but it most certainly can be. Um, but you're also going to want to state the start of the quest and if you have an approximate end time for the quest um and basically when your pcs are going to meet um particularly if it's if you want to have a briefing before quest starts uh other than that you're going to want to have court um you're also going to want to give them ample amount of time uh, for court uh, depending on the size of your event and whether or not there is principality court happening as well um, talk with those officers to get sort of a gauge on how much time you think that they will need. Uh, if you have an auction at your event, you want to state uh, when it starts and stops. And you want to have um, anything on there if there's any sort of site restrictions. So basically, if, um, if you have a, the, the site opens at a certain time or closes at a certain time, you're going to want to list that. And if you have any scheduled site cleanup time, um, throw that in there as well. Um, I think that about covers the schedule, which would take us into where your site is. Uh, Faye Wellen, would you like to head us on that, please? So, very important, uh, in your bid, you need to have a site. Um, that really needs to be on your bid. It can't be a TBD. Um, you need to check the availability of your site. Uh, so my recommendation is don't use the online call <laughs> because they're really bad at updating that stuff. Um, this is if you're using a city run site. I know in Ottawa specifically, they're really bad at updating that. Call the actual site to check the availability. 
Um, this doesn't apply for things like Block D, where we kind of have a site already, um, or you need to check with, like, if you have a regular site that you use, they might already have an event book. You need to make sure that it's available between those times, and you need to call them and say, hey, I'm looking to rent at this time, so they don't give it away by the time that you get your bid accepted. Um, so with the site, you need to check um, if they have the space for what games, tournaments, and classes you're going to run. Uh, you need to know what the amenities of the site are, uh, what is the accessibility issues, if we have um, players who require uh, wheelchair ramps or can't do stairs uh, or require specific bathrooms, that kind of thing, you need to know if that's available. Um, you need to know if there's running or potable water in the case of like a campground. Uh, you need to know what your garbage removal will be. Do you have to pay to have it removed? Do you have to take it off site? Can you just leave the garbage there for them to handle? Is there going to be a fee? Um, if inclement weather, is there shelter? If you plan an entire event outside in the park and it rains or snows and you have to cancel your event literally that day, you need to pre-plan if there's shelter available. Uh, also for like very hot days, you need shade, that kind of thing. Um, cooking facilities, as also speaking of the uh, feastocrat, please ask your feastocrat what they need. Uh, don't book a site and have a microwave if they plan on doing a six course meal. They will hate you. Um, conditions, site work and maintenance. So before you go, you need to know if there's anything that needs to be done to the site uh, on our behalf to make it a safe and uh, not a liability to use this site, i.e., um, I think we like to say, uh, Kendall used to say, um, make sure we're not fielding on a bed of rusty nails, please, <laughs> because that is a huge liability. Um, what amenities do you need to bring to site? So if there isn't any bathrooms, do you need to rent porta parties? If there's no garbage facilities, do you need to rent dumpsters and uh, account for that in your bid? Um, pavilion tents and or cooking equipment. Um, when you're at Bot D, I, we had to rent barbecues, right? That, that all goes into if there's available or can you, can you source them from other players? Um, was I doing emergency planning too or is that someone else? Yep, you're on emergency planning. That's me too? <laughs> okay, emergency planning. Also, very important, um, all of this emergency planning in the case of an emergency, say like a tornado, warning like we had at Tactics a couple of years ago. You need to have um, an, in, uh, an emergency plan to evacuate <laughs> and everybody who attends this event needs to have access to this information or be fed this information at Troll. Um, injury evacuation. For a sports game, injuries happen. We need to have a clear path to evacuate somebody. Um, heat stroke, that kind of thing. Can, if we need an ambulance to get to site, can they get there? Uh, these are very important liability things that you need to take into account. And there needs to be a general evacuation plan uh, sort of mentioned in your bid that, like, we're not trapping people for a huge liability. You need to, you need to account for, we hope no injuries or anything happens, but we need to account if it does. Um, site restrictions is not me. <laughs> <laughs> That's Darian. all you, Darian. <laughs> Darian, can you uh, site restrictions? <laughs> I can. That's me. Um, so site restrictions. Not all sites let you get away with whatever you want to do. Um, some sites, uh, specifically federal government sites, don't let you have smoking on the property anymore. Um, so you have to be careful. If they say no smoking, if they catch us letting people smoke, we're not. Gonna, we're going to lose um, credibility with them in the future. We might not be able to book sites with them, and we might actually get thrown off the site in the middle of an event. So we have to think about things like that. Um, not only are there things like smoking, uh, there's also things like uh, marijuana use or alcohol. Uh, those two you have to be pay attention to. Does the site allow you to have uh, intoxicants on it? Um, are you as the autocrat going to also allow it? Just because the site allows you to do something or have something on the site doesn't mean that you and the event have to allow um, alcohol, marijuana, or tobacco on it. You can uh, complete. You are well within your rights to ask players to step off site if they're going to have a cigarette or smoke up. It's up to you. Um, 
if you are going to allow them, you have to be able to identify who is of age. Uh, marijuana, I believe, is 25 and up uh, to smoke, and uh, alcohol is obviously 19. How are you? You have to give some thought to how are you going to identify them, and is it going to be wristbands? Are you going to have multiple wristbands? Are you going to be writing ages on wristbands? Just things to think about. Um, do you have a place for people to sleep it off? Um, when some people get drunk, uh, they might need some time to recover. If they drink too much or if they get stoned, then that's something you also have to consider because we can't just send, we can't just have people driving home right after drinking. So um, th this goes into the amenities. Is there room to camp? Is there cabins? Is there is there space in a medic tent we can have someone sleep? Uh, just important food for thought. All good stuff. Uh, I am covering when is your event scheduled? Okay, so <laughs> when is your event scheduled? It's going to be very important to coordinate with other parks to make sure that you are not double booking your event on the same day as another park. Um, you can talk with their monarchs, uh, check out their schedule, because sometimes it's in their term schedule on their, on their Facebook page. Um, there might also be other, like, side event things that aren't necessarily coronation or mid rain that parks might run. So um, keep an eye on event pages and um, things of that nature just to keep an eye out so that there aren't conflicts. Um, be very vocal and present um, when you when you do have a date that you are looking at um, so that other folks will also not then try to book on the same day that you are, are booking. Um, so open communication is always super important. Um, also, it, there's, there are some parks that have very close dates with their, um, with some close parks. So that would be for coronations and mid -rains. Uh, so some parks do end up doing joint events. Um, again, you want to communicate with that park to find what date works best for both parks and deciding, um, where you're going to do that and if that impacts the dates. Um, then you have principality events as well. Usually those uh, line up with particular events and that also then becomes a form of joint event, right? Um, traditionally, for example, right, um, bot D for us usually ends up being nine blades coordination, things like that. Um, so then that becomes a joint thing. Um, it also needs to line up with elections, so um, make sure that you go through the Kokora and check any sort of um, dates to make sure that you're not conflicting with any present elections that are happening. Uh, if there is any sort of conflict there, it might be like if there's like a week off or something like that, um, talk with the, the officers and Perhaps it might be simply a thing as easy as uh, announcing like a week ahead of time who wins the elections and just having the formal handover be at the event at court. But in all technicality, the person would start earlier than the event. So again, communication is everything. Communicate with those officers. Uh, the next thing is themes. So you must decide whether or not your event has a theme. Now. Up here, there are a lot of events that have pre-existing themes. Um, for instance, Clash of Talons in Lenagond, for instance, uh, is our Phoenix League event. So the theme of that is Phoenix League. So if, if your park has a particular staple event, you want to uh, be sure that you're aware of the traditions and that you keep with those themes. Now, there's going to be some cases to where there is not a pre-established theme. You can create a theme. That's totally fine. Um, let's say you're doing just a, a, a mid-ring for a small shire that has no pre-established themes. You can create a theme. Um, we had an opening in Linagond um, for an event this time around for um, one of our events. So I, I did... Paragon Boot Camp, so that was a themed event. So things like that. You can play around with things, and it 
also means that you don't have to have the same thing every time you go around to that event time. That could end up switching a whole bunch, or you could end up having a staple and that being the theme that you always carry on with. But again, open communication, find out what those traditions are, if there are any, and try to stay true to them if possible. Uh, the next is budgeting. Uh, Darian, would you like to, to explain that for us? Yeah, um, so when you're running an event, um, you want to make sure that you can at least cover your expenses. Ideally, you can generate some money for your park. Um, the more money that you generate at an event, the bigger and better your next event can be. Um, so there's a couple of things you want to consider when you're coming up with your budgets. How many players are you expecting? Um, how are you estimating your expenses? Um, every player has to have is probably going to have the feast. Every player is probably going to be, um, well, not every player is probably going to be, but you're going to want to make sure that you have enough medical supplies on hand that if somebody gets hurt, you're able to take care of them. And bigger events, the more players, more injuries, unfortunately. So you're going to need to budget for that. Um, smaller events, you can get away with slimmer budgets. Um, I know Feastocrats like bigger budgets. They, they can do more and have more fun. Um, I'm sure Faye Wellen can speak to that. Uh, now... Give me money. <laughs> give me money, I will give you good food. <laughs> um, when you're estimating your your budget, how much money are you planning to put towards your feast? Uh, you want to sit down with your feastocrat. If your feastocrat is Faye Wellen, you sit down and you say, well, I'm planning this many people. What, what can you serve? How much is that going to cost? How much does that look like per person? And it might be a discussion to, to tone it down a little bit because it's too fancy. Or maybe if you have extra budget, and you can bring it up. Uh, how much are you putting towards quest? If you sit down with your questocrat and say, what are you planning? Uh, if your questocrat says, well, I want uh, RFID tags on all the trees so I can make magic sounds with a clicky pen. I don't have a million dollars. Sorry. Um, but uh, that's... Uh, here in Moldenfang, we have a chest of a lot of quest supplies whenever I run an event. Uh, my quest crats usually just come to the house and they pick up, oh, I, this looks good for a puzzle. Oh, that's that's a perfect prop for some ore. That's, and they just grab and go. So there's no cost to it. So these are things you want to sit down with your quest crat and discuss. Um, weapons and marking tape. Uh, once you do your weapons check, you're going to have to mark everything, make sure that it's legal or uh, if it needs to be fixed up so that no illegal weapons are used on field. This cuts down on the injuries. It also cuts down on the medic budget later down the way. Uh, how much are you putting aside for your medic or your security? Uh, this is... Uh, you're going to want to have med kits for your staff because there's always going to be bumps, scrapes, and things where you want band-aids. How in-depth you go with that is up to you, or how much you can afford. Water. Uh, water is super important, and I know we're going to talk about it when we talk about to the medics or the or the feast, probably both. Um, there's a lot of crats that are looking for bottles of water, and you want to make sure that everyone after a battle game gets hydrated. Heat stroke is not fun. And it can lead to a lot of injuries, especially if you have people at an event like Bot D fighting in the middle of the summer heat in heavy armor. We like water. Um, how much are you putting towards the ANS? How much are you setting aside for your troll as well? Uh, troll, it sounds like the place where they're going to collect all the money and they're going to have all the cash in the box and ready to go. Um, if you make, if your site, if your site fee for each player is fifteen dollars, when troll starts, at the start of the day, they need a lot of fives because people are going to be coming in with tens and twenties, and you're going to have to make change. If you have auctions, you're going to want to make sure to have loose change on hand. And when you go to the bank, um, they don't give you a loan. You have to go in with about a hundred dollars and say, so can I get fives and toonies and loonies and all that jazz. Um, so you want to make sure that you have some money set aside for that. 
in your budget. Now, that, that's how you figure out how much your event's going to cost. How, how you're going to figure out how much you make um, is going back to the number of how many players are you expecting, uh, how much is your site fee? The higher the site fee, some players are less likely to attend. Because um, if, if uh, bot D were to be set to $50 per person, I'm certain that we'd have a lot fewer people coming up to the long drive to Sudbury. Um, but if you set it too low, if I go $5 a person, I don't even think I could uh, give a feast budget to the feast craft. <laughs> so find out what your expenses are, and you can convert that over and say, I need to make this amount divided by the number of players, and that gives you a basic number as to where you're going to need to meet to break even. Bump it up a little bit, because there's always something unexpected that happens. Um, you can also offer discounts. Uh, when you have small, some players, uh, a lot of us are in the age range where we're starting families, and we have a lot of little kids running around. Those kids aren't going to eat a lot of feast. So don't need to bill them the full amount. Staff. Uh, if Using Faye Wellen as an example again, if she doesn't mind. If Faye Wellen is uh, my feastocrat, she's giving up most of her day to make sure that everyone at the event has a good time and is fed. At my events, I don't charge my crats full price to get in because they are giving of their time. So I, I give my crats a discount. Um, and if you have a multi-day event, uh, are you are you billing by the day, um, or are you billing that's the weekend? Uh, and also with your discounts, if you're coming in from out of town, are you bringing people with you? Some autocrats I know do travel discounts. Uh, I believe it was some autocrats do five dollars a head per person in the car. So if you drove four people up, that's twenty dollars off your site fee as the driver. Um, so when you're when you're budgeting how much to charge per player, you you have to take these factors in. You have to take these um, discounts in into consideration for how much you want to set the price point at, because otherwise you may wind up um, short, and it'll cost your park more to run the event than to have not run it. And I know we all like having fun, and we like having keeping the costs on events low, but if the park treasury runs out, you won't be able to afford to run another event. So, um, figure out your expenses, divide that by the number of players you expect, and bump it up. A, I usually go about 15 to 20%. I don't know... Uh, Admiral Faywellen, uh, how much do you usually mark up yours? Or do you mark up yours? Um, it's, it's super dependent. It's super dependent on um, how many folks we tend to get at events. Um, a lot of times, right, you can, you can look at the orc and see um, generally how, like, historically how many folks usually come. You can see what the low number is, what the high number is. Um, but it usually is around the same ballpark. Um, it's one of those uh, hope for the pet best but plan for the worst type of situations. You look at that low ball and see mm -hmm. like, right, you can even go through and you're like, oh, I know that I have 11 crats, right? So I know how much each of them would be coming in, you know, what the charge for them would be. Mm -hmm. So I know that we are guaranteed this much attendance. Right? But other than that, we don't have a guarantee of anything else, right? We can we can see mm -hmm. and be like, okay, so this person is totally going to come. This person's already said they're coming, right? You can kind of go through that and sort of piece it. But, like, if you have an event like Bot D, that's, you know, that's going to be a lot harder to gauge than, you know, your your local park's mid-rain, right? You know, if you have a Shire, mm -hmm. you're pretty certain you know how many of those folks are going to be there. Um there's a large chance that a lot of them are going to be your crats, right? Um, so it's it's dependent. It's very dependent. Um, yeah. <laughs> I use sort of a similar method. Um, at least with mine, it, you go back. Um, at least in South Osh. So I'm going to use my own park as an example. I've, I've done for other parks, but I'm going to use South Osh. 
Um, so I know traditionally the winter event, super low. Um, but if it gets switched to a principality event, and then your numbers are immediately going to go up. It also is dependent on what you're offering. So like in the case of Bossy, it's like a three, four day event. It's okay. going to cost more to run. So you're going to have um, a higher site fee. Whereas if we just do a day thing, it's probably going to be a lower site fee. Um, it's also dependent on what you're serving for fee, what your theme is. Like, I mean, we did one year in Felfrost, we did a Canadiana theme. Uh, it literally cost me 60 bucks to make pancakes for, you know, 60 people. So the event fee was really low uh, because we knew we wouldn't, everything was already done, donated, the site was donated for free, that kind of thing. We could have a low site fee to just go and have fun as opposed to like a very long, intense super event. So yeah, it is dependent on really what the event is. And yeah, looking back on the arc on what the traditional numbers are, they haven't really changed much in a couple of years they all pretty much stay the same um i think anyone can go on the orc and pull that report and just see or just go back and look at the dates yeah um yeah i know in the case of bot d we've had everywhere from uh 90 something people one year right up to 150 the next and oh you had 182 when i did thief thank you uh <laughs> i didn't realize we got that high that year um, but mm -hmm. Bot Season actually really is a really good example. Uh, the site is usually free from the grills, but we usually buy them a gift as a thank you every year. Um, or it's uh, money we invest into their property, like re-graveling roads or um, leveling some of the grounds. And that's our site, site fee in quotations. Uh, the garbage bin is about 500. The... Um, the ditch field lights uh, that we have are usually around 500 to rent. The porta potties, uh, because we don't have uh, uh, washrooms with running water on site, that's usually in the range of 800 ish. So it costs around $2,000 to run Bot D, not, in, not including Feast. And we have to divide that up by how many people we expect. And that's usually um, the rule of thumb that a lot of people like to use is divide that by the 100 people that we are sure to get. Because when it's 180, that extra 80, um, if uh, I, I'm pretty sure if I look at Faye Wellen on Friday night and go, we're at 180 people, um, you have to feed an extra 80 people. Here's, here's an extra $300, go. Um, she'll probably smile and run into town or smack me and then run into well, town. Freak, uh, freak out. <laughs> 80, to 80 people the, the day before, I'm probably going to be having a panic attack and you're going to need to be giving me <laughs> something. So real quick, um, just in chat, there's a, a comment from Lord Valiant um, just making a, um, a point of uh, if you do have pre-registration, uh, that also gives you a good idea um, ahead of time of who will definitely be coming, right? Mm -hmm. so that's... Yes, uh, never use the uh, Facebook attending or maybe as your numbers ever. It's never right. You could say I have um, 100, 200 people maybe attending and then have 50 people show up. Uh, it's happened to me before. So I, as, I use it actually as a gauge. I actually use it as a gauge to see, um, take half the maybes. And that, that's it. Don't don't expect more than half the maybes. And of the yeah. people who say they're going, 75% of that. Because the, mm -hmm. there's always something that comes up. There's always um, there's always that uh, opportunity for overtime that somebody's going to say, well, I wanted to go to the event, but, you know, time and a half's worth it. And and they don't turn off the, the going marker on the event page. So the, there's mm -hmm. always a drop in both those. I, I use it as... I take it with a heavy grain of salt any time I've used it to judge my numbers going in. Yeah, I usually use that as a gauge, but I use it as a folks to check in with, right? Um, if I see that they're listed as going, I'll talk with them and be like, so I heard you're going, like, you have everything, travel plans done, you're good, like, right, just to kind of, you know, inquire on those things, right, um, if you if you have a group of folks that say that they're going and you're at field with them, you're like, 
oh, hey, who's all going, right? Like, knowing that they have said that they are going, right? Um, or just making lots of reminders, right? Telling your crats to make sure that they list that they're going. Um, I've had a lot of crats where it's just like, <laughs> like, it's the day of the event. It's like, so the event page still says you're not coming to our vet. Are you coming to our vet, buddy? <laughs> like, you probably, you probably say you're going to our vet. It's like. Right. It's also, right, as much as that's, like, a, a grain of salt gauge for us, also, if if folks see that there's a ton of people coming to an event, that is incentive to go, right? If you're like, wow, there's going to be, like, 200 people there? Oh, there's all these people that I haven't seen in years? Oh, man, this is going to be the event to go to, right? If, if you mm-hmm. have a bot D where it says that only six people are attending, you just be like, maybe maybe we'll look into something else that time right like yeah it's still you know i think it's still gonna be a stellar event because you guys are amazing um but yeah it's just it can be it can be a gauge for for folks's interest in going so again make sure your crats say that they're going because those are the only like guarantees you got in there and yes there mm-hmm. could be times where that's gonna get switched up but yeah it's uh the likelihood. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Darian, was that all for you? Is that um, you good? Or anything else you'd well, like to that, add? That, that's all it really was for me is talk to all your crats, figure out what's going to be served, how much the site's going to be, what uh, each of the crats expects they're going to need cost-wise, and talk to your park. Uh, your park often has stuff in storage and uh, Wolven Fang, a couple of years back, I went through the books and records, and I noticed that every mid-rain, every event, we had been buying um, juice jugs and salad bowls and tongs and all this other stuff. And I wound up, I, I had already run three or four events trying to figure out where, where did these go? Where did these, uh, They were just sitting in storage. We had a stack of salad bowls about three feet tall just because people kept buying, kept buying, kept buying. And it might sound silly that it's like, oh, it's only 10 bucks. It's only 10 bucks. After a year's worth of events, that's fifty dollars that awesome. you wouldn't have to have spent. So definitely talk to your parks, um, and talk to talk to the players too, uh, because if some players can't make it up because oh I have no I have nowhere to stay at uh, at uh, the Felfrost Coro, you never know. The autocrat might know somebody who has uh, has some spare has a spare room, has a spare air mattress, has something, and perfect you can drum up more players to attend absolutely i should say you as the autocrat would know the person to <laughs> and then you know who's coming. the clear right, veneers guild that. does that yeah <laughs> hey. yeah honestly great, pro- great program seriously check that out um okay so our next thing is the bid submission